Hello, and welcome to the second Dr. Crunch podcast. My name is Viral. And my name's Arjuna. And we'll be taking you through everything you need to know about Parkinson's for finals and a bit beyond. As ever, the aim is to be able to look any clinician on the wards or examiner in your exam in the eye and answer both the simplest and toughest questions with confidence. Okay, so this podcast is in four sections. Number one. We will discuss the function of the basal ganglia in normal health. Number two, we will discuss enough about the biochemistry of Parkinson's to be able to predict the effect of its treatment. Number three, we will discuss the clinical features of Parkinson's. Number four, we will discuss the investigations of Parkinson's, focusing on when they're indicated. So, what is the function of the basal ganglia? The basal ganglia modify the output of the ipsilateral motor cortex. From a clinical perspective, the basal ganglia have three important functions. Number one, to maintain muscle tone. Number two, initiating movements. And number three, stopping them. Now, Viral, would you like to tell us a little bit more about the biochemical problems? Oh, certainly, Arjuna. Well, the overall effect of dopamine is to excite the thalamus, which leads to an increase in the amount of motor activity. Acetylcholine decreases the total amount of thalamus activity. So, as a massive approximation, the ratio of dopamine to acetylcholine determines the effect of the basal ganglia on the level of motor activity. Of course, in reality, there are plenty of other neurotransmitters. Now, in Parkinson's, there is a loss of the neurons of the substantia nigra, which produces dopamine. This therefore leads to a reduction of motor activity. So, just moving on to clinical features now, and... I was wondering, Arjuna, if you could just briefly tell me what's the difference between Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism? Parkinson's disease is, in the vast majority of patients, an idiopathic condition, which is the most common form of Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism is a term used to describe a particular collection of symptoms. So it's a syndrome, namely tremor, rigidity and bradykinesia. And now Viral is going to go into the features and the history that might suggest a diagnosis of Parkinson's. Okay, so for finals, the examiners will want you to focus on the triad of tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia. The loss of postural reflexes is usually considered the fourth cardinal feature. Make sure you mention these at the very start of your answer, and everything else is pretty much a bonus. So, looking at a patient who's typically about 55 to 65 years old, and a common initial presentation is actually a loss of dexterity, and of course Parkinson's should be considered in any patient with falls. So in the classic idiopathic Parkinson's, the symptoms are usually unilateral at the onset, and then they spread to the other side. Early symptoms may include a reduced sense of smell, vivid dreams, and unusual movements during deep sleep, so particular rapid eye movement sleep disorders. Uh, There can also be some constipation, weight loss, depression, and restless legs. Later features include small handwriting, difficulty swallowing, difficulty turning in bed, and fatigue, and a Dementia often occurs at an advanced stage of the disease. Uh, We'll be covering the examination findings in a separate video. So, Arjuna, if you were asked by a finals examiner to classify tremors, what would you say? So tremors can be thought of as resting, postural and intentional. Parkinson's is the main differential for resting tremor. Classically, this is 4 to 6 hertz and diminished on activity. If there is an apparent tremor at rest... It's worth asking yourself if this may instead be a career. There are two main postural tremors, physiological and benign essential. All of us have a physiologic tremor when we hold our hands out in front of us with the elbows straight and fingers extended and abducted. This is at about 10 to 12 hertz. This tremor can be enhanced by anything which increases adrenergic drive. For example, thyrotoxicosis, salbutamol, hypoglycemia, anxiety, and of course caffeine. Benign essential tremor is usually a distal symmetrical tremor of the upper limbs with the low amplitude and frequency of about 8 to 10 hertz. There's usually a family history and classically alcohol will improve the symptoms. Now, a common question you might be asked by a consultant or by an examiner is what the difference is between rigidity and spasticity. So, rigidity is an increase in resistance to passive movement affecting flexion and extension equally and staying the same no matter how fast the limb is moved. It may be increased by asking the patient to perform an action in the opposite limb. This is contralateral synkinesis. 
Having a tremor with rigidity leads to the sensation of cogwheeling on examination. Spasticity is different because it's velocity dependent. The faster you move the limb, the greater the resistance. In addition, in the upper limbs, there will be a greater resistance to extension than flexion, and then the lower limbs, it's the opposite. Spasticity is suggestive of a pyramidal tract problem. So, apart from Parkinson's disease, is there anything else that can cause Parkinsonism? So Parkinson's accounts for about 85% of Parkinsonism. After that, the next most common cause is drug-induced Parkinsonism, which accounts for about 7% of cases. Any drug that antagonizes dopamine and can find a way into the CNS may cause Parkinsonism. This includes antipsychotics, especially the older typical ones such as haloperidol, and metoclopramide. Metoclopramide is, is a dopamine antagonist that can cross the blood-brain barrier. This form of Parkinsonism tends to be symmetrical and less associated with tremor. The next common cause is vascular Parkinsonism. The risk factors are similar to those of a stroke. Vascular Parkinsonism tends to cause a lower half Parkinsonism. And finally, rarer causes can include Wilson's disease and Lewy body dementia. Some consider Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's to be a spectrum of diseases. For diagnostic purposes, dementia occurring more than one year after the onset of Parkinsonism is referred to as Parkinson's dementia. For dementia occurring before or around the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, the diagnosis is Lewy body dementia with Parkinsonism. Lewy body dementia is characterized by fluctuating levels of cognition, visual hallucinations, and also difficulty judging distances. The Parkinson plus disorders are a group which look like Parkinson's but are much more severe. Median survival is only seven years compared with the normal lifespan in Parkinson's. There are two you really need to know about for finals. Number one, multiple system atrophy majorly includes autonomic dysfunction and ataxia. Of note, it used to be called Scheidrager syndrome. The second you need to be aware of is progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, and this is characterized by vertical gaze palsy. So, what do you do if you suspect someone has Parkinson's? Well, you refer the patient quickly and untreated to a specialist. And what investigations do you need to diagnose it? A trick question. The diagnosis is a clinical one. A strong response to L-DOPA is suggestive of idiopathic Parkinson's disease, although other causes of Parkinson's may respond too. A lack of response is very unusual in true idiopathic Parkinson's disease. For patients who fail to respond to therapeutic doses of L-DOPA administered for 12 weeks, MRI or CT is used to exclude rare secondary causes e.g. supratentorial tumours or normal pressure hydrocephalus. A DAT scan shows if there is an actual striatal dopaminergic deficiency and is used when there is an unusual disease course or continued poor response to treatment. It cannot prove that there is idiopathic Parkinson's disease as Parkinson plus syndromes as well as Lewy body dementia will also show striatal dopaminergic deficiency. A normal scan does however raise the likelihood of the patient having drug-induced Parkinsonism or simply an essential tremor, and a normal DAT scan also suggests that L-DOPA or dopamine agonists would not benefit the patient. So, in summary, what have we learnt? We have learnt that the basal ganglia modify the output of the motor cortex. The basal ganglia maintain muscle tone and initiate and stop movements. We have learnt that as a simplification, the ratio of dopamine to acetylcholine partially determines the effect of the basal ganglia on the level of motor activity. A lack of dopamine, as occurs in Parkinson's, leads to reduced motor activity. We have learnt that the cardinal clinical features of Parkinson's are tremor, rigidity, bradycarnesia, and the loss of postural reflexes. We have learnt that tremors can be classified as resting, postural, and intentional. We have learnt that there are causes of Parkinsonism beyond Parkinson's disease. Among the most common are drug-induced and vascular Parkinsonism. There is also Wilson's disease and Lewy body dementia. Parkinson's plus syndromes include multi-system atrophy and progressive supranuclear palsy. We have learnt that investigations are usually not necessary, although a failure to respond to L-DOPA is, is an indication for a CT or MRI. DAT scans have a role in determining 
if there is a true loss of dopaminergic striatal neurons. So, thanks very much for listening to the second Dr. Crunch podcast. The next podcast will be about the management of Parkinson's disease. As ever, we're really keen to hear from you, both for feedback and suggestions for improvements, and also just to know that there are some people who are listening to us. So, if you'd like to visit us at drcrunch.co.uk, or drop us an email at thebigcrunch at drcrunch.co.uk, that would be appreciated. Thanks once again for listening. Thank you.